thank you to all who <clears throat> are here and who continue to trickle in. I'll just give my introduction for a minute or two here uh, while the rest of the people fit, um, come in. So my name is Paul Meyer. I'm the editor of Acres USA magazine. We're uh, pleased to have you with us here today on this uh, presentation and Q&A session with Steve Diver focusing on the use of the herbicides in uh, certified organic, natural, ecological growing systems. Um, this webinar is sponsored by USDA's uh, top program, the Transition to Organic Partnership Program, which is uh, a new initiative that's providing support to farmers who want to transition to organic. And it, um, it's a neat, neat program. It specifically includes funding for certified organic farmers who serve as mentors and also funding for new and aspiring organic farmers who want to be mentored. So um, definitely look that program up, T-O-P-P, -P, uh, top. Um, so Steve Diver is uh, a graduate of Oklahoma State University, degrees in horticulture. He has Worked as an extension horticulturist, a farm manager, and a soils consultant since 1984, including 18 years as an agriculture specialist with ATRA, uh, the National Sustainable Agriculture Information Center, which is funded by USDA and managed by NCAT, which is the National Center for Appropriate Technology. But Steve's currently the farm superintendent at the University of Kentucky's Horticulture Research Farm in Lexington. So the format for today is Steve's going to give his presentation here for 20, 25 minutes or so, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A from attendees. So if you want to ask a question, please type that into the Q&A box down there, and we will sure make sure that Steve answers those. We are going to be recording this webinar, and it'll be available within the next few days at Acres USA's YouTube channel. And uh, you can find out more about us, uh, mag our magazine, our books, live events, and more at acresusa.com. We also have a new member site. I'm just going to throw out real quick. Um, all of the articles that are published in the print magazine are, are now going to be online. Uh, there is a paywall, but uh, members obviously have access to that. And that website is uh, members.acresusa.com, or you can get to it from acresusa. Dot com. So with that, uh, thanks again to Steve, and please take it away. All right, Paul, thank you so much, and hello, everybody. All right, so for today, we're going to do an update on natural and organic herbicides, and I'm going to be talking about just some applied work that we've done with some organic herbicides here. It's not like we set out to do a trial. But over many years, I've trialed about half a dozen of these, and I've worked in organic for a long time, so I do know a little bit about the history of this. So let's get started. And so this lecture is really a spinoff of the article that uh, I published in the April issue of Acres USA magazine on organic herbicides. So um, you can refer to that for more details. And so let's start with some terminology terminology what are we talking about so in general these are this these this group of herbicides are known as organic herbicides they're also known as natural herbicides and then i've also seen the term green chemistry herbicides so you know uh synthetic herbicides do have some drawbacks and it doesn't matter if you're involved in eco agriculture organic sustainable, regenerative, et cetera, there's a real interest in reducing the toxic load and finding uh, ways to reduce or eliminate synthetic pesticides. So that's why these are known as least toxic herbicides, alternative herbicides, and non-chemical herbicides. So now what is the difference between organic and natural? So uh, we have this saying in Kentucky, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. So by the same token, you could say that all organic herbicides are natural, but not all natural herbicides are certified organic. And so that's the way I'm kind of distinguishing these is that uh, 
it's in, you know especially for certified organic that not every single one of these kinds of natural herbicides on the market are allowed and, and approved for certified organic. So this is what we're talking about. Um, this, these types of natural and organic herbicides, they're all non-selective herbicides with a burn back effect. They're contact herbicides. They do not function as systemics. And so they have a real use on the farm, but they do have some limitations. Uh, but um, this got started a long time ago. Um, and so one of the first ones that came out was just straight 20% acetic acid. And then people have blended essential oils. And so you'll have products like acetic acid and citric acid. Uh, there are several products that are ammonium, ammonium nanoates and then some products that are blends of different essential oils like clove and cinnamon oil. And more of a new generation are this cap caprylic and capric acid. And then and another example is ammoniated salt of fatty acids. But really important to make that distinction that they're non-selective burn back. So we look at a brief history of organic farming starting in really the 1920s, biodynamic farming got started in Europe and was really considered to be the first modern organic farming system. Red Rodale Organic Farming and Gardening Magazine started in the 1940s. And then, <laughs> look at this, what really took off, you know, you come out of the 60s, there was a lot of interest in, uh, you know, Earth Day, and then you had this advent of Acres USA Magazine in 1971, focusing on eco-agriculture, Maine Organic Farming and Gardening Association, 1971. iPhone, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, 1972. CCOF, California, California Certified Organic Farmers in 1973. And this just goes on and on. A lot of these organic farming organizations have had newsletters and conferences for 50 years now, a lot of experience. But then a couple key things happened. 1980, USDA report on organic farming. And that just grew and grew until, actually, I got that wrong. That should be the 1995 Organic Foods Production Act, which uh, developed the into the USDA National Organic Pro Program in 2002. And so when we look at the National Organic Program and we look at the standards, uh, Section 205.205 is the Crop Rotation Practice Standard. It talks about using different crop rotations and cover crops to provide for pest control and annual and perennial crops. So that's a starting point to understand that. And then if we get into section 205.206, it talks about how weed problems may be controlled and it talks about several practices. And then section E says that when practices uh, above are insufficient to control weeds, a biological or a botanical substance or a substance included on the national list of allowed synthetic substances may be applied to control weeds, provided that these are all documented in the organic system plan. And so then we get down to section 205.601, and this is where they talk about allowed synthetic substances. And for, for herbicides, that includes soap-based, However, they are restricted for non cropland areas, uh, for farmstead maintenance like roadways, ditches, right-of-ways, building perimeters, and so forth. Now, what's really helpful when you get into organic and whether you're transitioning to organic or you're actually certified organic, this is where, this is where everybody looks to find out what kind of product inputs are available for crop production. So those are the three big logos, the OMRI li listed products, WSDA or Washington State Department of Agriculture, and the CDFA or the California Department of Food and Agriculture. So those are the three big ones. And if you're looking for a product that's approved that you could run through your ACA, your accredited certifying agency, who you're who you're inspected and certified through, that's what you would be looking for. But that is not that is not the be all end all. There's another way that you can do that, and that is 
through a manufacturer's statement of organic compliance. The problem with that is that it turns into a very slow review and approval by your accredited certifying agency. So I have done that one on the bottom. There's some companies that don't, just don't want to go through OMRI. They're kind of independent minded Mavericks. And um, so, yeah, those are your options. Now, really helpful though, these, these listings have grown exponentially. There's hundreds and pages of some of these, um, like the Army, Army list. Now, let me give you a couple of tips. Uh, it's not apparent to everybody, but uh, when the Organic Foods Production Act started in 1995, they wanted to develop an in-depth examination of products. So what the USDA, National Organic Standards Board has commissioned are hundreds of these TAP reviews or technical evaluation reports. And so you'll find many kinds of these natural or, or organic herbicides that have been thoroughly analyzed. These are roughly a dozen to 20 pages long. Detailed analysis assessment of what is this product? How is it used? Uh, how does it fit the organic program? Are there alternatives to it, et cetera? And so then that is voted upon by the NOSB board. It's either approved or uh, prohibited. And so if it's approved, then it's forwarded up to the National Organic Program and uh, goes through some many, many processes. And then, you know, that's why you'll see that many of these are approved through this, through this method. So that's the first one that's really helpful to know about. Now, the second one is from the Cornell University's program on integrated pest management. And this one looks at active ingredients that are eligible for minimum risk pesticide use. And so, for example, they addressed essential oils, seed oils, organic acids, protein meals, and surfactants. And Brian Baker, who's one of who's been around organic a long time has been involved with putting together 32 of these different titles. And all of those are online as well. So for example, in this one, essential oils, for example, here's one on cinnamon oil. And it, it talks about down there at the bottom is that it is used in combination with clove oil and its components like eugenol as a herbicide. <laughs> so when we look at the the active ingredients, and we look on the labels of all these natural and organic herbicides, they're really broken down into acetic acids, organic acids, soaps, and essential oils. There's also a number of them that are just crude botanicals and also this iron HEDTA, but the, the iron HEDTA is really more of an ornamental uh, turf grass kind of a product. So it's very common that you'll see products that have 100% active ingredients. For example, that's just sold as 20% acetic acid, or they develop these blends, for example, acetic acid mixed with some kind of organic acid to enhance its effect. And then this was the table that I put together for the Acres USA article. And you know, you can see the active ingredients, you can see some products like, you know, example, acetic acid, and then acetic acid plus citric acid, ammonium nanoate ammonium salt of fatty acid, the caprylic and capric acids. And then you see things like citrus, citrus citric acid, clove oil, eugenol, lemongrass oil, pale organic acid, and so forth. You see some a couple of them that has sodium chloride and sea salt and vinegar. So some of these are approved for use in organic production. Some of them have the labels from OMRI or WSDA. Some are geared to home gardeners and ornamentals. Some have prohibited ingredients. For example, the pell organic acid in anything with sodium lauryl sulfate are prohibited. So this list is not just strictly certified organic, it's in general. So what's important is that you would study the label, look at the ingredients, check with your ACA, your, your certifying agency, and really look for the OMRI label or the WSDA label. WSDA label. And then, so a couple really important points there, I think, to make is that, again, these are selective 
burn back herbicides. They do not have a systemic effect. There, I didn't have time to include that, but there was a, a product that was sold as organic for a while and they claimed to be systemic and it turned out that it, they, they included some systemic herbicides in there, uh, some synthetic herbicides. They had to take that off the market. So that's the first point. There are so non-selective burn back or contact herbicides. And the second point, at least in my opinion, is the primary use of these are non-cropland areas that tend to get weedy. Um, so it's not like you're going out into the field with, as a tool to control weeds and vegetable production on acreages and acreages of vegetables. But on any farm, these non-cropland areas tend to get weedy. And so if you want to keep the farm tidy, you have, you have agri-tourism, you have people visiting the farm, it's very effective to go out and clean up these areas. So here's an example. I want to share a couple examples of some, some of the demonstrations we've done on our farm. This one is con from Contact Organics. It's based in Australia. <laughs> There's a distributor here in Iowa. This one is interesting because it started. It starts off with the weed terminator, 20% acetic acid, but it's blended in a one-to-one -one volume with the this boost material, and the boost has organic acids and surfactants that enhance the e efficacy of the 20% acetic acid. And so, so for example. Here's, here's, uh, here's again a non cropland area that tends to get weedy back by the equipment yard, mare's tails growing up in the gravel. And so you uh, just, you know, you use four to six fluid ounces of the acetic acid plus four to six ounces of the organic boost. And that brings the actual concentration of acetic acid to three to 5%. And look how effective it is. Very effective, non selective burn back effect. And then saying, here's another example. This is like the ends of rows, kind of not out in the, in the row, but at the end of the row that tend to get weedy. And this is pigweed that's been applied and it's been very effective burn back. So that one is not, does not have the Omri label. The company is working on a new formulation. So that is in progress. That is in the pipeline. And there's a lot of hope for products like this to continue to be developed to increase tools and access for organic farmers. For example, the holy grail of organic farming would be a, like a burn back on cover crops that'd be effective and that would be affordable. And that's part of like what some of these companies are trying to aim for. Another example of another product that we, we've used on the farm is this Suppress EC. And this is the one with caprylic and capric acid. And so this is an example. This is what you, this is a research farm. So this is a summer squash research plot. Um, it's in this, this whole field is about a third of an acre. And so you can see that you've got it planted. This is on plastic mulch with drip irrigation. And you see it's getting weedy. That's called, that's hairy kale and soga. So let me show you a little sequence of how we manage this field and also put into perspective how it's used, but also integrated with other tools that a, a normal working vegetable farm would have. And so for this, in this instance, you see the little, little bare strip ne right next to the plastic mulch. I sent out a worker with this organic herbicide and he sprayed the edge of the plastic mulch one time. And so you can see this nice effect where it's been cleaned up right next to the plastic mulch. And then the, the row middle still need to be worked over. So you see I've got a cultivator working through there. And then I've got it nicely cultivated. And that kind of uh, system is set up on eight foot centers. So we can put a little small tractor through there. And that's like a small Kubota with a kind of a Perfecta style cultivator. You see you've got tines, you've got a rolling basket on the back of it. So that can move up and down between these alleyways if they're set on eight foot centers. If you have these set on six foot centers, you'll really need a BCS walking tractor. Now we also have that and we do work in narrow uh, alleyways like that on six foot centers. But um, so that's this system and you see a lot of buckwheat growing on the farm. We use a lot of cover crops, 
But here's the burn back effect. And these are the little non cropland areas I'm talking about right along the lay flat hose very gets really often just totally full of weeds. But this little hairy gallon zog, it couldn't stand it just fried completely. To, and it's really effective kill on a broadleaf. Now, if you got grassy weeds, the grassy weeds have growing points below ground. They're going to come back. You're going to have to do a repeat application. But here is even also on the row ends that you can see was very effective where the drip tape is coming out. And then, yeah, look at that. That whole field is cleaned up. And that was literally a one-time uh, cultivation. That field looks that beautiful from all that work that we did just like that. So, And then all this on the outside is living mulch. Uh, buckwheat, and that can keeps those areas completely weed-free by growing a, a cover crop like that. So, you know, just to make the other point then is that, again, these, the, the, the fundamental way that a working vegetable farm is going to control weeds is not organic herbicides. It's going to be through a whole cropping system effect that includes your crop rotation and other sequences. So, an important part of this would be specialized equipment, in other words, the steel in the field. And our farm, we've developed this stale seed better on the top left. <laughs> that was custom built on the farm. So it both shapes beds and does very shallow tillage, less than one inch, to knock off the flushes of weeds. So we'll run that through there. Next, we'll put in the subsurface drip irrigation, and then we'll run that through there again. We'll wait a week and run through there again. And we can we can knock out 95% of the weeds that will ever emerge on a bed by using a stale seed bed cultivator. Uh, but we also have basket weeders. We have a finger weeder. I think we were the first university in the country to bring in a feeder, finger weeder. So that way you're achieving both between row and in row weed control, either direct seeded or tra transplanted crops. So it's important to have the right equipment to match your cropping system, your bed width, your tractor tires, all that. And the other big tool that we have on the farm are weed suppressive living mulches. Uh, so we'll do, for example, in the warm season crops, we'll do teff. Teff is a very, very tiny seed. There's 1.3 million seeds per pound. We will look at the seeding rate that typically extension will put out for establishing forages like a hay field with TEF, they'll suggest 12 pounds per acre. And what we will do is triple that rate. If you want to do a weed suppressive living mulch, you always increase the seeding rate and go high in density. So we'll put out 36 pounds of TEF per acre with a turf spreader, and we get very effective weed control. We can have like just zero weediness involved in these alleyways after you get these nice living mulch cover crops established. So you, you can see some in tomatoes. Also, you'll see some weed barrier where the lay flat is. Keeps everything nice and tidy. You can see some peppers over here, just completely uh, um, taken, taken care of by the living mulch. And then also a nice garlic setup. That one would be more like a perennial ryegrass and crimson clover uh, seeded in the, fall, in the fall. And this is the following spring. So. Yeah, that's my big point, is that fundamentally we control on working organic farms is through a whole system of cultural practices that include crop rotations, using cover crops, using living mulches, and having specialized equipment and weed barriers working for you. Maybe it's organic mulches working for you. It's not because you're going to go out and work and, and control weeds on a whole farm with organic mulches. I mean, I'm sorry, with organic herbicides. So yeah, the focus is they're a tool for the farm, especially on these non-cropland areas that tend to get weedy. And they can be very effective. They are very effective burn back. You'll see immediate results. Uh, sometimes you'll have to come back and do a repeat application, depending on the weed species. If you hit broadleaves when they're very young, you can fry them and kill them. When broadleaves get really, really big, they're harder to kill. You'll just have to do a repeat application. So really, that's a, a really brief update on organic herbicides. And uh, yeah, that's it. Let's let's see what kind of questions some people have. Thanks, Steve. That's great, great stuff. Yeah, if if you have a question, please type it into that Q and A uh, section there. I do have a couple just that came to mind myself, uh, starting kind of from the back there. How do you terminate that teff or that clover 
The tap. Okay. So yeah, you have, you know, if you're, we do, we, we do both the, on the six foot centers, we do have the walking, uh, the BCS walking tractor with a front mount flail mower. Mm. It's a, it's a wonderful tool We're, you know, that's a, a pretty good size investment. You're going to have a, a good, uh, solid horsepower BCS walking tractor and a front mount flail mower. But look at the power of that combination when you're with, dealing with alleyways, living mulches, and the ability to manage that living mulch by mowing it. And typically, you're looking at mowing it probably twice during the life, uh, the crop cycle. And it just creates the, like a duff, like a kind of a duff. It'll just sit there. Sometimes it'll grow back. Depends on your climate. Mm -hmm. And then is it, I don't, I'm not familiar with TEF. Is it winter kill? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's winter kills. Okay, and it will not reseed, um, come, you know, in our climate. I mean, it's not like a problem that, you know, it's going to come back year after year. Got it. Yeah. Starting to get a couple questions in here. Um, one from Macy. Did you include any organic adjuvants with the herbicide applications, like in the pictures that you were showing? The answer is no. The suppressed EC, for example, is uh, and many of these products are are are. Yeah, I should make a note of that. A lot of these are. Let's just go back and start with acetic acid, twenty percent, when it first came out, and we're talking about when the National Organic Program came out in two thousand and two. These were available at that time. And so if you take 20% acetic acid, you dump that in a sprayer with no dilution and you spray it out just like that. It's very costly. So that has very limited use for only limited spot spraying. Most all of these modern herbicides are diluted. And so that's it. You, you're going to take the, the herbicide, you're going to dilute it in water according to the label and you spray it out. Uh, the only the exception was this contact organic, which you're taking the acetic acid, you're adding in the boost product together, and that has all the emulsifiers and surfactants and organic acids, and that is the adjuvant. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Um, I think this is probably a question that is on a lot of people's minds. How do these herbicides affect soil microbes? Okay, so... It's a good question because that would be a you'd have to really examine the the technical literature to answer that one. So um, my my suspicion is they they don't have much of an effect. And just as an example, the one where you have the organic boost because of the organic herbicides, I mean the organic acids, you actually increase the soil microbes. Mm. So let's you know let me just flip this concept here just a minute uh when we put something in a tank and spray it onto crops and on the soil you have you're now have many options so this is a whole nother conversation but there are ways to develop tank blends with microbial food sources to boost soil microbes mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean there's no reason with some of these sprays that you couldn't include some nutrient nutrients, some microbial treatments, all in the same tank. I would, I probably would qualify that if you're putting out um, a foliar fertilizer. Yes, right. If you're doing a, a an injection, like a fertigation injection, yes, but probably not with the herbicides. They're very caustic. Uh, they probably would not be friendly to you know adding microbes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then. Question from Darren, what's your local ACA? Is that um okay? So Darren, we are I'm in I'm in Lexington, Kentucky. And in Kentucky, we do have the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, which is our is a is a accredited certifying agency. Uh so it depends on what state you are. A number of states do run an organic certification program through the State Department of Agriculture. But then there are also regional uh, in, uh, certifying agencies that will travel within their region and provide on-farm inspection and certification. There's a many, there's you know several dozen of these. 
Good. Here's a good one from Bryce. They use suppress, but have a difficult time getting it cleaned out of the sprayer adequately to keep it from also killing the pump seals. Any type of pump or cleaner you'd recommend? Yeah, Bryce. Um, <laughs> we we had a blue Jacto sprayer, and I noticed that the, the, it was like eating the paint inside there. So uh, there are some tank cleaners that are kind of typical from ag suppliers that I would suggest you could just look into. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a more general question, I think, uh, from Brian from Texas. Um, as you see people transitioning to organic, especially regenerative organic, do you see differences in soil health, productivity, soil infiltration rates? Yeah, Brian, so for sure, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, that's just like a, almost like a given that we see that all the time. Uh, that's why... That's why all the alternative farming systems, whether it's eco-agriculture, organic, sustainable, regenerative, have, have prospered because farmers have a real visceral reaction to improved soil health. And they see improvements in the infiltration. They see more worms. They just really feel that the organic matter is improving. So uh, all that comes from the integration of cover crops and minimizing soil disturbance and keeping the soil covered and using multi-species cover crops and maybe maybe grazing cover crops. It's all all these different things together that that result in this. Great. Uh, and David recommends humic acid for a tank cleaner. Have you experimented with that at all? Does that sound? Um, he's 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 making that uh, he's giving us a tip. Yeah. For 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 Darren, I think. Uh, yeah. So, so that's a good tip. Yep. And then Brian's also asking if you feel like these practices can help mitigate drought, wildfire, flooding concurrently. That'd be rough if you have all three of those happening. <laughs> yeah. Well. It so, could so Brian, Brian, actually, he's down in, in Central Texas, and I and I was in Central Texas, so I have some familiar. Some, I'm familiar with the the region down there. The answer is that yes, uh, you can in, in help absolutely mitigate uh, against climate by getting these practices adopted. And let me just give you one example. One of the the farmers I referenced in the article in Acres USA was. Mary Howell and Claus Martin up in, in New York. And what they did is they're, they're farmers and um, Claus had a farm that he got from his dad and he adopted organic on, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres. And, you know, he learned how to do it and became good. And his neighbors said, hey, you think I could do it? And he goes, yeah, let's, you know, let's get you started. And so the ne next neighbor started doing it. Now there's like six farms that are, have over several thousand acres of contiguous certified organic land. And don't you think that has an impact on the watershed and the, and, and the local climate? Yes. So the more people, that, the more that we can get this adopted, the more we can have an impact on ecosystem wide basis. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it is a learning curve and it's a process to get there. And we have, I'll mention as well, we have Steve's article that he's mentioned here as well as um, some articles by Claus and Mary Howell Martins and many others on our new member site. Um, which again, it's in the chat, but members.acresusa.com. Um, Nico from South Africa, Western Cape, um, markets biological and organic products. We sent a copy of this. This recording, it'll be on YouTube. So yes, you can. everyone can get a copy of it within a few days. Um, yeah, she's thinking, or he think, is thinking about putting together some acetic acid, acetic acid products there in South Africa. Um, yeah, if you have other questions, please, please type them in here. Um, what do you think, Steve, about would these products ever be applicable in an orchard context, uh, you know, in row? I know that's a big issues keeping the between the trees 
weed free? Is oh, that... absolutely. Yeah, you, that that's that's for sure. I mean, you know, in you know, just just working in horticulture, one of the fundamental things about growing trees is that they need to be the the you should maintain a vegetation free zone around the trees when they're young. And I I I, I think of trees in terms of the survival and establishment period is three to five years. So three years is the survival period and then extend it out over five years. After five years, if you let grasses and weeds and cover crops grow around the, the tree, it's not gonna be as big of an impact, but but it's really important to maintain that weed-free zone around them so that gives the trees are very vigorous, they get established and not competing against vegetation. So yeah, these, these organic herbicides could be very helpful for that. And uh, even if you did wood chip mulch, for example, which would be a very excellent practice around trees, and you're going to you're also going to encourage fungal soil biology, which trees really like, you're going to get pop up weeds in wood mulch. That's that's a for sure because the the weed seeds blow, they land in a moist, nice organic environment. They're going to start growing, and you could really just keep it clean that way. So I did see a, I did see a question on what is the what is typical gallons per acre application? And we're, we're still very similar. You're still looking at 20 gallons application per acre. But, you know, again, we're not we're not really applying organic herbicides on an acre, acreage basis. We're just doing a more of a spot basis. So, you know, you're looking at, you know, whether four gallon, four gallon, uh, you know, backpack sprayer, like a Solo or Jack, Jackdo sprayer or something like that. You're just pumping it up and, and spot spraying weeds that way. How many, so how many, say that again, for a four gallon backpack sprayer, you'd have how many ounces of product in there along with the water? Well, it depends on the, it, it's it's based on a per gallon basis, whatever the label says. It's whatever the label uh, says. You know, sometimes they say, you know, six fluid ounces or nine fluid ounces per gallon. Got it. Yeah. Albert's asking, have you ever heard of glacial acid? Made of glacial, I think you might be referring to glacial acetic acid, and that is essentially 20% vinegar. Uh, household vinegar is 3%. So we're talking about an industrial strength, 20% uh, acetic acid. It's not really vinegar. It's, you know, you know that people would consume at all. It's, very, it's a really caustic material, but it is sold that way. And I would just, you know, I didn't have time to go into that, but in general, I, I would say... The 20% acetic acid is very, very caustic. You should use it with caution. It's kind of been sold into, you know, like to gardeners and people have gotten, you know, if you get it in your eye, that's very bad. If you breathe it, it's not good. So, you know, you should use goggles and gloves and those the same kind of thing you would do with anything that's, you know, uh, you know, you're trying to kill vegetation with this caustic material. Mm hmm um, Brian's asking also about regenerative work being done in Coffee County, Tennessee. Are you familiar with that? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, someone else is asking about these products being applied to a garden setting. I mean, yeah, these for for home garden setting i think it would be similar to what you've been discussing yeah yeah the, there are these many of the, uh, like the the list that, that I, I put up there that's published in the uh, the acres usa magazine uh, they're sold into the home garden market as well and they just have smaller bottles maybe with a uh, quick application and and again if you have um, the edge of your garden the sidewalks where weeds grow around trees where these grow. This is where these products are very useful. Um, and again, right where the vegetables are growing, that's where you have mulches, that's where you have a hoe to cultivate or you're using tractors to cultivate. So these are not, you know, these are not really just to like, you know, out there growing the vegetables. It's, a, it's a, on the perimeter where the weeds are growing that you're trying to keep nice and tidy. That's where these are really helpful tools. Yeah, good. Um... It's a question about water quality in the chemical mix. So it'd be worth the effort to use water circulated through a flow form for efficacy. Um, or maybe just, can you talk about where, <laughs> where you're getting your water for this? I yeah, mean, this, it's not a, it's, water, it's so you water, could probably use some, water you know. Quality water quality would not be super important for something as simple as an organic herbicide. Uh, whatever tap water you have would probably work, uh, probably helpful. 
Now, when you do get into, there is, when you get into tank mixes and you're doing, you know, 100 gallons, or, you know, at a time or, you know, 300, 500 gallons at a time, there is some knowledge about looking at the pH and making a buffer if you, if you need to buffer the pH. Uh, and now when you get into, let's just talk about eco-agriculture. So the Acres USA umbrella is, says eco-agriculture. And that's really what I, uh, what Art Nanner said is, it's at the, is the, is the mixture of advanced organic and advanced conventional. So it gets into more sophisticated things. And so some people are doing RO or reverse osmosis water, or they're doing that with structured water and they're putting together, say, a foliar blend and microbials to boost the crop vitality and health of the, of the crop. Uh, so the flow forms, for example, would be something that, that come, came out of the biodynamic farming experience. And again, that's a way to enliven or structure the water. And so that would be an interesting thing. And, you know, some of the farmers use those, but it's not important at all. It, all, it doesn't have any bearing really hardly with organic herbicides. Great. Question about BCS, trying to learn what attachments, implements work for their soil. Any good resources? I'm a big BCS fan. I have one. I have about a dozen implements myself. So <laughs> yeah, we've, we've run some articles about that in the magazine and Earth Tools in Kentucky. I assume you go down there. That's to, right. To Earth That's Tools. right. We have we have Earth Tools in, is in Frankfort, Kentucky. You can look up by Tyler. You can look up Earth Tools in Frankfort, Kentucky and get their catalog and look on their Web page. And that'll show you the kind of implements and attachments that are available for the BCS. And in terms of resources that you can get from other farmers, uh, basically any kind of market farming uh, forum or Facebook group where market farmers are gathered, you, you can get tremendous help from your fellow farmers. But uh, the, the whole, one of the, one of the, I would say going back to the 1980s, um, what happened was there was a revolution to renew the skills and tools involved in market farming. And Elliot Coleman, in his book, The Master Organic Grower, was instrumental in helping people think about tools. And so, uh, but, you know, because, you know, you know, coming up through the 1920s and 40s, a lot of farmers had these things. It was just taken for granted. They just kind of fell out of use over time. And nowadays, these tools are back around and there's just no, no issue with people getting access to tools to make everything work. JM48 who's been a really really nice the everything that has improved over the last 50 years you know let's say just going back to the early 1970s when when these movements uh, like acres, acres USA and these organic farming organizations started getting going so everything has improved on the knowledge level and on the crop input level and on the tools level yeah JM48 who's a big uh, market garden proponent of the BCS as well. He's got a bunch of videos. We did an interview with him that was in the February issue, I think. And um, yeah, John Kempf just did an interview with him as well on his podcast. Sure. John's the Sam Fortier up in uh, Canada, Quebec. Yeah. And uh, he's he's done some excellent work in that area too. He's got some uh, one or two books out. What uh, what BCS implements do you use besides that flail mower, Steve? Uh, we use the we use the rear time tillers. We have the spade plow. Mm -hmm. We we also have another implement that's a rotary harrow on yeah. a on a walking tractor. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The power harrow. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, it's Good. a nice one. Well, now, on, on our large equipment, we 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 use every other kind of implement you can think of, but we also have a very large Emont spader. Hmm. Yeah, does a superb job of soil conditioning. We do a tremendous amount of cover crops on this farm. It's really just beautiful to see how, how many cover crops we have on this farm. And they get very large. We have uh, flail mowers that we chop and the, the cover crops down and make a green chop. And that's incorporated by the spading machine. Mm -hmm. Does a beautiful job of conditioning the soil and adding the green biomass to the soil to feed it. And uh, I've even seen data that it, it's kind of counterintuitive. It's very popular for everybody to jump into no-till, but I've seen data where you can actually improve the soil humus by using a spading machine. 
because mm. it is incorporating the organic matter that is digested and turned into humus. Wow. Yeah. Um, can I ask just one last question? We're about at our time. Uh, that photo you had earlier where you'd had someone spray along the edge of the plastic and then had, had you know, done a little bit of cultivating in the middle. Was the spraying done before the the large leaves of those zucchini came uh, into the row or he wasn't spraying? Right at the, it, that was a good question. It was right at the tipping point when the leaves were just touching the edge of the plastic. Everything was timed beautifully because we only did this one time and we got through the whole crop with just one single uh, weed control, you know, sequence. And so just when the leaves were touching the edge, the weeds were right there. They were sprayed on the edge and then we cultivated down the alleyways and that was it. So it was a couple of weeks maybe before that photo was taken. No, just like a week. A week for earlier. Okay. Yeah. Just like just within a week. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. In fact, no, that I will just I'll go back. So the photo that I showed, that was the bear strip that you that you saw was sprayed like three days before I cultivated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was yeah. all happened, it all happened in a sequence. Great. So someone says they love their power hero. That's nice. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, Good. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This has been really informative, I think, and hopefully it's been profitable for folks. Uh, again, this has been sponsored by the USDA's top program, TOPP, uh, which you can Google if you're organic certified and you know, want to make some money being a mentor to younger farmers. Uh, this is a, a neat program for that. And uh, check out more of our work from Acres USA at acresusa.com. And thanks for attending. Have a great day. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.